That's an interesting question. So the diagnosis of neuroendocrine tumor typically is a histologic diagnosis. Um, what, you, what does that mean? Uh, you get tissue. So either you cut out someone's small bowel and mm -hmm. get their tumor, or uh, you stick a needle in through the skin and get a tissue diagnosis. Um, now, where to put the needle and how to decide where to get the biopsy from uh, can be informed by imaging. So a CT and MR or a dotate PET can be used to tell a surgeon or an interventional radiologist where to perform a biopsy. But the diagnosis typically is not clinched or made based on imaging itself. The first one you said was CT, MR? CT and MR. And MR. And then separately, uh, dotate PET. Great. It's an interesting question. New technology. So I would say that in the next five years, not a lot of new technologies are going to come to market or however you want to say. I think what excites me about neuroendocrine tumor is uh, what we're doing now, I would say, is primitive. <laughs> the way that we do PRT, the way that we think about uh, dosing, the dose we administer, the timing of it, uh, is going to change over time. So it will become more patient-specific. Uh, the way we use dosimetry to calculate how much dose a patient gets will change over time. So the way that we practice with the tools that we have, I think, are going to change. And so the, the next five years, to me, are going to be a time where we start to optimize the treatments that we're given uh, and giving with the FDA-approved doses. There will be new agents that get approved, but the ones that are currently in trials aren't dramatically different in a sense. But the way that we administer them uh, in the the, the timing of it, I think, is going to change a lot as we move forward. This is a very good question, um, and it's a very astute observation. So I'm a radiologist also, so I read these studies every day in the clinic. Um, and we historically, outside of an endocrine tumor, look to the past study to see if there's a difference. And with most cancers, cancers grow pretty quickly. So if there's no growth in three months, you're pretty happy and you say there's no growth. And if there's growth, then you do something. With neuroendocrine tumors, I would say the criteria by which we define growth is less because the growth can be so slow. And so if a radiologist is reading a study and not keeping in mind that this is a neuroendocrine tumor patient, uh, they might not be thinking about these slower rates of growth, which can be clinically relevant in a patient with a neuroendocrine tumor. Uh, so that sort of asks the question, well, how do you get your radiologist to go back and look, which from a patient perspective can be very hard uh, because patients generally don't have interaction with the radiologist, right? They interact with their oncologist. And so I think the key points to take in mind are if you're a patient who has neuroendocrine tumor over a long period of time and it's not changing over a long period of time, I would just ask your oncologist to ask your radiologist for you to make sure that they went back and looked at multiple studies prior. And what I like in general for radio, like the report uh, to show is to say, okay, there's no growth from this immediate prior, but when has there been growth from? So uh, it's nice to go back over all your studies and say, okay, no growth, no growth, it's been growing. If I go back to 2015, I can definitely demonstrate growth from there and give an idea of the progression since then. Yeah, but this is a common mistake made by radiologists uh, just because of our normal practice doesn't involve looking so far back. Uh, and the best way to try to address that is to talk to your oncologist, to talk to the radiologist. I think the majority of net specialists who do this are aware of this issue, uh, but people who don't treat neuroendocrine tumors frequently don't think about this this way either from the oncologist's perspective. Yeah, so this is particularly relevant in the setting of the liver. Um, in the liver, uh, after you get liver target therapy or get systemic therapy, tumor cells will die um, and a lesion will stay there. So you'll still have a tumor or a mass in your liver and you don't know whether or not that's viable tumor or dead tumor. Um, and there's a couple ways you can look at that. One, when you give contrast, the contrast will enhance viable tissue, but it won't enhance dead tissue. So the early phases after you give the contrast, the arterial phase or the portal venous phase, will be very helpful to uh, characterizing tumor that's viable versus not. And the second way you can do that is obviously with somatostatin receptor PET. Uh, dotate or dotatoc PET will obviously only go up and be taken up by tumor that's viable. That is a good question, actually. That's, I think that's a, so A, we don't do that generally. So most sites don't measure that. 
Uh, there are, uh, you know, sort of automated computer, you know, we use deep learning, machine learning techniques that are starting to get it being able to provide that number uh, to give you an idea of tumor burden. Uh, and I think it would be very helpful, particularly from a research perspective, uh, to understand how tumor burden impacts PRT, how it impacts future progression and other uh, toxicities. Um, historically, we look at it uh, and visually say, okay, there's 30% or 60% tumor replacement. And because it's not very accurate, we don't typically report that in our reports. Um, so we just describe the sort of gross number of tumors and size of the tumors. I think over time, uh, and this will be probably still a number of years from now, tools will come out that can accurately and reproducibly measure the amount of tumor burden in the liver. And, and that would be something that would be helpful in the report, but we don't do that currently. Okay, so again, another question that you can't provide a specific answer. Uh, I think, you know, so my mentor, who I think is going to be on this soon, is Emily Bergsland. Dr. Bergsland uh, is very, very good. <laughs> and one of the things she taught me early on is this idea of pace of disease. So everyone's neuroendocrine tumor grows at a different rate. Okay, and so not all neuroendocrine tumors are created equal, and even more so, the KI-67, this thing we look at on pathology, doesn't one-to-one -one predict how fast a neuroendocrine tumor grows. And so the pace of your individual tumor will determine how frequently one needs to re-image you as a patient. Okay, it also depends on where you are in your disease process and how urgently you feel like you need to be treated. So there are some patients who have slow growing disease who don't want to be treated and they might only need to be imaged once a year, even though they have widely metastatic disease. There are other patients whose tumor's pace is much faster, that's growing more quickly, and in those patients you want to repeat the imaging more frequently. Okay? But if you as a patient aren't going to want to institute a new treatment anyways, then you don't need to be imaged as quickly as well. So it's really is between the patient, the pace of their tumor, and their oncologist about how frequently you need to have repeat imaging with your tumor. So there's certain types of neuroendocrine tumors uh, that may not come back. Uh, what I mean by that is uh, like a bronchial carcinoid that's surgically excised, that's early stage, uh, will probably, probably not come back. And you can image that over time with a CT scan in the lung because it sees it very well. Also, certain types of rectal uh, carcinoids, if they're on polyps and you take it out and the nodes are negative, those are unlikely to come back. But if you have a small bowel neuroendocrine tumor, uh, and you take that out, the chance of that coming back, as I was mentioning earlier, near 100%. And so this is, I think, really where you should work with your oncologist. Um, it depends on the type of tumor you have and the extent of the disease initially. And even if you have no evidence of disease with some types of neuroendocrine tumors, it's very likely that they will come back over a long period of time. This isn't next year, but over uh, many, many years, these tumors can come back. Uh, so the frequency of imaging will become sort of less over time. Uh, but we do repeat imaging for 10 plus years in patients with small bowel and neuroendocrine tumors who don't have evidence of disease. Now, there's a caveat to how that statement was phrased. It was talking about the use of blood markers versus imaging to detect recurrence. Remember that not all neuroendocrine tumors secrete hormones, and so routinely surveilling blood levels of hormones is probably not valid unless you know the type of hormone that your tumor was secreting initially. So if when you were initially diagnosed, your tumor was functional and secreted a specific hormone, you know that hormone, you can then follow that hormone over time. If you don't know that hormone, it's probably not worth you know, measuring all sorts of hormones in the blood uh, to routinely surveil a patient. Uh, the take-home point, hopefully, over this whole thing is uh, everything is very patient-specific. What each individual patient needs uh, is not the same as what other patients need. And so working with your oncologist and asking questions, and I think hopefully what this shows uh, and hopefully you get out of this is knowing what questions to ask with your, your physician. Oh, I, I want to know if I need this modality or not. Just bring it up to their attention will actually sometimes change things because they might not have thought of it. Um, and that's nothing wrong for each individual physician, but having the knowledge to ask your physician questions is really valuable and I think can help uh, patients achieve better care at their institutions. Mm -hmm.